Welcome to the first episode of A Guide to Australian Spiders. I've been wanting to start this series for ages, hindered by a combination of my own laziness and uncertainty about how the series is to be structured, and I'm not going to pretend I've resolved the latter. But either way, I've decided to finally take the plunge. Particularly on the internet, Australia's spider fauna is repeatedly the subject of widespread misinformation, leading to their worldwide notoriety. Many people, both in this country and overseas, are under the impression that our spiders are alarmingly large and dangerous. That's not to say there isn't accurate information about Australian spiders out there, but when the work and experience of educated academics and even passionate hobbyists is overwhelmingly drowned out by a tidal wave of fear-mongering, clickbait nonsense, something anyone who has watched my reaction videos should be very familiar with, it can become very difficult for a layperson to discern factual information from amongst the swirling, turbulent cesspool of hysteria. And that's the reason I decided to start this series. Hopefully it will make accurate, drama-free information more accessible to a wider audience and open more eyes to these heavily misunderstood and utterly fascinating creatures. The guide aims to cover the major groups of spiders present in Australia, with the more obscure taxa being of lower priority. More familiar and or well-studied groups, such as huntsmen and orb weavers, are likely to be covered in the most detail, as there's more information available and it'd be more worthwhile for the general public to be educated on spiders that they've been likely to encounter in their day-to-day -day lives. Medically significant groups like funnel webs are ones I also intend on giving more in-depth coverage, for obvious reasons. Lesser known spiders will still be featured, but not as prominently as there would only be so much knowledge to work with. Because this guide is intended for a lay audience as opposed to an academic one, when discussing the distinguishing features of various spider groups and species, I'll mostly be focusing on traits that any average Joe should be able to recognise. The external morphology, coloration, patterning, webbing style, habitat and distribution for example. Conversely, I'll give little attention to internal or microscopic features, as it's pretty safe to assume most people wouldn't have access to microscopes and dissection kits. But before I get into the actual guide, I figured it'd be important to devote the first couple episodes in the series to the taxonomy, classification and characteristics of spiders as a whole. In this first episode, we'll be taking a look at where spiders fit into the tree of life. In order to do this, we'll first have to ensure we have an understanding of taxonomy and phylogeny. Taxonomy concerns the classification of living organisms into groups of differing ranks. The main ranks being kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus and species. Although several other ranks exist in between these, such as infraorders, superfamilies and subfamilies, as well as unranked clades, a term I'll explain later. Groupings of higher ranks, such as kingdoms and phyla, are very broad and may contain hundreds of thousands or even millions of species. Lower classification ranks, such as families and genera, in contrast, are more specific, containing only closely related species. This can be visualised as a sort of nested hierarchy, with groupings of lower rank being situated within those of progressively higher ranks. Now time for a quick outline on phylogeny. Phylogeny is a branch of science, pun not intended, that concerns the evolutionary relationships between life forms, which are typically illustrated via branching tree-like diagrams, with each split or node denoting a divergence from a common ancestor. A deeper split between two taxa indicates a more distant common ancestor, and therefore a more distant relationship. These diagrams are called phylogenies, or evolutionary trees. I'd also like to add that the term common ancestor, even though it is used in the singular sense, does not refer to one individual organism, but to a population. 
It's worthwhile to remember that evolution occurs at the population level over multiple generations. Individuals do not evolve. Each diagram represents a hypothesis of relationships between the life forms included. Based on multiple lines of evidence such as comparisons of morphology and genetics. As new information is discovered, phylogenies, like all hypotheses, may be either supported or falsified. And in the case of poorly studied taxa and or those for which limited evidence is available, as is the case for many fossil organisms, the relationships may be unresolved. One term that is often used in phylogeny, and which I imagine I'll be using a fair bit, is clade. A clade represents a grouping of organisms that goes back to their most recent common ancestor, and includes all descendants of said ancestor. This is also called a monophyletic group, although let's face it, clade is a hell of a lot easier to say. All taxa within a given clade will be more closely related to one another than they will be to any taxa outside of the clade. Another term important to phylogeny is sister taxon, which refers to the closest relative of another unit in a phylogeny. Not sure what I'm on about? Well, let's try and fix that. In this phylogeny, B and C are sister taxa and form a clade labelled 4. The sister taxon of clade 4 is taxon A, with clade 4 and taxon A forming a larger clade 3. If you still don't understand, you're an idiot. Just kidding. Feel free to comment about what you're having trouble with and I'll try to help. Making no promises though. After all, I'm not a teacher. I'm just a part-time cross-country coach whose language and sense of humour may or may not be age-appropriate for some of the younger boys at training. Spiders are members of the Metazoa, a group more commonly known as the animals which form a taxonomic kingdom called Animalia. The animal kingdom in turn is divided into numerous phyla, with spiders belonging to a phylum called Arthropoda, an immensely diverse and successful phylum occupying almost every conceivable habitat on the planet, from the highest mountain peaks to the deepest reaches of the ocean. The arthropods are by far the largest animal phylum in terms of species count comprising over 80% of all animal species. So, in other words, when someone says, I'm an animal lover, but I hate bugs, which I hear rather often, they're essentially saying they're an animal lover who hates more than 80% of all animals. Here's a phylogeny of the arthropods. I have also included the onycophorans, or velvet worms, as an outgroup. These strange, secretive and intriguing creatures are closely related to the arthropods, but not arthropods themselves. Extant, in other words, living arthropods, are generally divided into two main clades, the Mandibulata and the Chelicerata. A third extinct clade, the Trilobitomorpha, is also recognised and there is some debate on how it relates to the other two. The Mandibulata are the largest of the two extant arthropod groups, and as you may be able to tell by their name, members of the clade are characterised by the presence of mouth parts known as mandibles, which are shared by all members of the group and are not present in the Chilicerata. Members of the Mandibulata include the exceptionally leggy subphylum Myriapoda, Myriapods consist of four orders, two of which, the chylopoda or centipedes and the diplopoda or millipedes, are rather familiar, while the other two, the poropoda and the symphyla, are minuscule soil-dwelling creatures that exist unbeknownst to many. Myriapods include some of the largest terrestrial arthropods, with numerous centipede and millipede species being capable of attaining very impressive sizes. While I'd love to talk about them more, I do have to remind myself that this guide series is about spiders. And let's face it, it's not like centipedes don't get enough attention on this channel already. So moving on. The sister taxon to the myriapods is generally considered to be a clade called the Pancrustacea, which contains two subphyla, the Crustacea and the Hexapoda. 
There is an alternative relationship proposed called the Atelocrata hypothesis, in which the myriapods and hexapods are more closely related to one another than to the crustaceans. But it isn't as well supported as the Pancrustacea hypothesis. The crustaceans, which include crabs, lobsters and shrimp, as well as many other lesser known taxa, are the dominant arthropods in marine environments although they also occur in freshwater and terrestrial habitats, albeit to a lesser extent. The hexapods, as their name would suggest, possess six legs. The overwhelming majority of hexapods, indeed the majority of arthropods, and in fact the majority of animals overall, belong to a single class, the insects. Interestingly, evidence suggests that the hexapods may actually be descended from crustaceans, meaning that in accordance to the law of monophyly, which states that any given taxon belongs to every grouping it descended from, hexapods are crustaceans. However, crustacea is traditionally defined as excluding the hexapods, rendering it a paraphyletic grouping, a group where one or more descendant clades are omitted. Because of this, I have denoted it with a double line, which I have seen being used to indicate a paraphyletic group before. So there's our quick review of the Mandibulata done. Now let's take a look at the sister taxon to the Mandibulata, and the one to which spiders belong, the Chelicerata. As is the case with the Mandibulata, one of the principal characteristics of the Chelicerates are their feeding appendages. These, called Chelicerae, are generally pincer-like in shape, although in some lineages they have been heavily modified. In spiders, for instance, they each bear a venomous fang. Chelicerates all possess six pairs of appendages. The chelicerae, as one would expect given their function in feeding, are the foremost pair and the only appendages located in front of the mouth. Behind the chelicerae are a pair of pedipalps, which vary immensely in structure and function among the different types of chelicerates. Then there are four pairs of legs, used predominantly for walking, although one or more pairs may be modified to serve more specialised functions in certain lineages. For example, the ambly pigeons, in which one pair of legs is greatly elongated, useless for walking but excellent for feeling around. And it was just my luck to find that a new study had been published mere days after I finished the drawings for this phylogeny, thereby rendering it outdated almost immediately after completion. Now I know how paleoartists feel when they're drawing Spinosaurus. The phylogeny I have illustrated displays what has been traditionally accepted as the relationship between the major extant chelicerate groupings until recently. Here, the arachnids and a strange group of marine arthropods called the Zyphoshurans, more commonly known as horseshoe crabs in spite of being only distantly related to their namesakes, are sister taxa, together forming a clade called the Euchilicerata. Meanwhile, the Pycnogonida, or sea spiders, so named because of their resemblance to such, are more distantly related. Now, however, a recent publication indicates a rather different relationship between chelicerates. On the left, you can see the original phylogeny. Note that an extra group is included here, the Eurypterids, which I omitted from my illustration due to the fact that they are long extinct. Like all chelicerates, save arachnids, Eurypterids were mostly marine, although some began living in freshwater environments and even ventured onto land, although they never became fully terrestrial. Among them were some of the largest arthropods to have ever lived, such as Eucalopterus and Hippotopterus. Now let's take a look at the phylogeny on the right, which depicts the relationships indicated by this new research. While the Pycnogonida remains the most distantly related, the proposed relationship between the Eurypterids, Zyphoshurans, and Arachnids has changed rather drastically. Now, the Merostomata, the clade that contains Eurypterids and Zyphoshurans, is nestled within the Arachnids. In short, Eurypterids and Zyphoshurans are now Arachnids. This is fascinating stuff. So fascinating indeed that I can't even manage to be pissed off about how quickly part of my video became outdated. 
If you want to read the study for yourself, I have linked it in this video's description. Within the chelicerates, spiders belong to a class called the arachnida. Arachnids include pretty much all of the most familiar chelicerates. Not only spiders, but scorpions, mites, ticks, harvestmen, and solifugids. They are predominantly terrestrial animals, but a relative minority occupy aquatic environments as well, both marine and fresh water. They are by far the most diverse group of chelicerates, comprising over 100,000 described species. Spiders form an order within the arachnids called the Araniae, and they alone make up almost half of all known arachnid species. Their incredible success and consequent prevalence in almost every terrestrial environment on the planet has made them easily the most familiar and frequently encountered out of all the arachnids. Granted, mites are exceedingly abundant too, but their minuscule size means they often go entirely unnoticed. Well, that and the fact that mites don't spin giant sticky webs across walking tracks, conveniently always at face height of course, or pop up in the most awkward places while you're driving. So that is episode 1 complete. Next time I'll be taking a look at the external anatomy of a spider and outlining the characteristics that define them. If you enjoyed this video then feel free to check out some of my other uploads, let me know what you thought in the comments section and don't forget to subscribe. Thank you very much for watching, that is it from me and I shall see you again very soon.